Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the Sinai to Zion study. In last week's session, we discussed the fact that the Lord provided for Israel food and water. After bringing them through the Red Sea, after defeating Pharaoh, he now demonstrated his tender side. Again, the whole story of the Exodus is framed after the pattern of a man pursuing his potential bride-to-be. And so now we get to the part of the story, which is what I call the proposal. And it's clearly framed as a proposal. So, of course, in modern times, when a man wants to marry a woman at a certain point within their courtship, most often, at least traditionally, he gets down on one knee, he presents her with a ring, and he asks her if she will marry him. Now, of course, I understand it's not always done that way, but that tradition that we have today in modern times actually goes back to some very ancient traditions that you can even see reflections of in the Bible and in particular in the story of the Exodus. So in a previous session, we discussed the fact that as the Exodus begins, the Lord stated his intention to Israel. He said, I will take you to be my own. Now, I discuss this as sort of the Lord stating his intentions. So the equivalent in, in sort of a modern courtship relationship would be this. As a young man, or I guess any aged man, takes a woman out, a prospective bride, he states his, he, he states his intentions. You know, so it's not a situation where, you know, a girl is friends with a guy and he says, hey, do you want to go get lunch? And she's going, I don't know, is this just lunch or does he just want to be friends? He makes it very clear. He says, I want to take you out on a date. I'm interested in you romantically. He makes it very clear. She's not left afterwards going, what was that about? I don't know how to, you know, this type, the Lord made it very clear. If you will accept this sort of invitation, I'll lead you out of Egypt. I will take you. And of course, in that session, we discussed the fact that that term, lakak in Hebrew, it, it's most often used in the context of marriage. You know, multiple, multiple statements throughout the scriptures where a patriarch or a biblical figure would take lakak, a particular woman, to be his bride. But now we're getting to the point where it's official. So after dating for a while, eventually the man actually proposes if he's if he's actually moving in that direction. So in Exodus 19, 1 and 2, it says, In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of Egypt, they arrived at Mount Sinai. So now the people have actually arrived at the base of Mount Sinai. In the last session, we looked at the what I believe to be the split rock. That's actually to, just to the north and the west of the mountain. Now this is a massive area. Even when you're driving today, it takes a few hours to get from the rock around to the base of the mountain where Israel would have been at the base of the mountain on the eastern side of Mount Sinai. So this could have taken them wa walking, I don't know, you know, it could have taken another week or so. But it's actually in the third month after they left Egypt. And of course, if you do the calculations, this all sort of aligns with the biblical spring holy days. If you start from Passover, you get to Pentecost. We're getting up to Pentecost. When the covenant is made between God and Israel at the base of Mount Sinai, that would have aligned with the holy day of Pentecost. And the timing between Passover and Pentecost is exactly what we have here. And that's actually what it's patterned after. So this is where the Lord actually went beyond simply stating his intentions to sort of the more formal proposal. So Exodus 19, verse 5, the Lord says to Israel, Now then, if indeed you will obey my voice. Now notice with previous covenants, for example, with the Abrahamic covenant, the Lord just makes a statement. He says, I am going to give you and your people this land. It was a unilateral promise from God to Abraham and his descendants. This covenant, however, is a bilateral agreement between God and Israel, between two parties, and there's a lot of statements such as this, if you, then I. If you don't do this, then here are all the bad things that will happen. If you do these things, here are all the good things. So it's a bilateral agreement between two parties, which, by the way, of course, is what a marriage covenant is. In many ways, a marriage covenant is a covenant between two people committing to one another, but really it's two people committing to God. 
that they will commit to one another. So it's actually two sort of separate covenants, individual covenants with God, as well as a covenant unto one unto another. So the Lord says, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. He says, for all the earth is mine. Now the statement here is saying, look, I'm the creator of all things. Every nation and every people belong to me. I created them all. He says, but if you will obey my voice, if you will say yes to what I'm offering you, you alone will be my possession. Now the word there, my own possession, it's a very special word in the Hebrew. It's segula, segula, and it's a very unique word. It refers to the most prized possession of a king. So you could say the Lord was offering to Israel, if you will say yes to me and obey me, you will be the crown jewel. You will be my most treasured of all possessions. I own everything, but you will be my favorite. You will be the most special of everything that I own. Among all the nations, you will be sort of my, not my one and only, again, he's the God of all the earth, but you will be my my uh, my unique special possession. It's a very tender, beautiful word. So then he states this, and this is this goes in. If you will accept, the Lord says, if you will accept um, this offer, and then he says this in verse six, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now a priest, of course, is a mediator or an ambassador between God and another party. Right? A priest is in many ways a mediator, a go-between, an ambassador, a representative. So the calling here, the Lord was, was stating what Israel's unique calling in the earth would be, but it's two things. It's both individual, okay, every individual within Israel is called to be a priest of sorts, a representative of God to the Gentiles, but as a people corporately, Israel was also called to be a unique nation, a unique people that would be priests, ambassadors, representatives to all the Gentiles. Now, of course, later we see this um, in the pastoral epistles of Peter, where Peter actually says that we, the church, are a holy kingdom, a priesthood. So as we become believers, we've actually been brought into this calling to be ambassadors, representatives, and intercessors for the nations in order that all the nations would also know God as the Lord has uh, introduced himself to us. As we know him, we want everyone else to know him as well. The invitation to become a kingdom, okay, so it's more than just you will be my ambassadors. He says you will be a kingdom, and this is very important. The invitation for Israel to become a kingdom, this was in fulfillment of two things, two promises. The Lord's promise to Abraham and the Lord's prophetic promise to Judah. So as we trace the development of the Lord's promises, as we trace the development of messianic prophecy in the Old Testament, one of the most foundational um, parts of this story are the Lord's promises, the Lord's covenant to Abraham. And the Lord had said to Abraham, basically, I will give you and your descendants this piece of land, this promised land. In order to possess the land, you have to rule over it. And so even in the Abrahamic covenant, there's this inference that out of your people, Abraham, would come a king, a king that would rule over and possess the land as a representative of your people. Okay, but in Genesis 12 verse 2 through 3, and this is sort of the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. The Lord said to Abraham, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will make you into a great people, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So the full statement, of course, is I will make you into a great nation. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Many Christians that are pro-Israel are very well aware of that statement, but they often leave off the last part of the statement, which is, and in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so there is, the first part of the verse is this very unique election and calling, this very unique selection of Israel to be a special people. On the other hand, the reason that he has chosen Israel is because he loves everyone. He loves people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. And so I sometimes say, God so loved the world that he chose Israel. 
because it's through Israel that the Messiah would come. And so here you can see this statement. The Lord says, I'm going to bless you and choose you, and you will be special in order that all the nations can know me. You will be a kingdom of evangelists. That's their calling of ambassadors, of representatives, of intercessors of those who will pray and cry out that the nations would know the Lord and those who would open their mouth and be witnesses in order that the na- and that's also our calling as well. Further beyond that the Lord clearly had promised to Judah at the end of Genesis Genesis 49 he promised that through Judah a king would come who would be a ruler over all of Israel 49 verses 8 through 10. Thus if Israel accepted the Lord's proposal the kingdom, pro- the kingdom program would be initiated. This has always been part of the Lord's promise, is he says, I'm going to create a kingdom. I, he, the Lord chooses Abraham. He turns Abraham into a people, a family. He turns that family into a people. He turns that people into a nation. He turns that nation into a kingdom, ultimately, through which all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And, of course, when the Messiah returns and reestablishes his throne on Mount Zion, he reestablishes the throne of his father David, the knowledge of God will go out and cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And during the millennium, everyone will know him from the least to the greatest. And thus the, the uh, promise to Abraham would be fulfilled. And then here's the beautiful part, Exodus 19, 7 through 8. So Moses came and he called the elders of the people and he set before them all the words the Lord had told him to say. And all the people answered together, together, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought the words of the people back to the Lord. So when a man kneels down, offers his prospective bride-to-be, uh, her, he, he asks her for her hand in marriage, she either says, I do, or eh, maybe not. (laughs) So Israel here says, I do. He says, will you marry me? And she says, yes, yes, I will. But here's the thing, guys, and this is really kind of funny. They had no idea what they were getting into. The Lord says, if you will obey all the commandments that I'll give you, you will be my special one. And they go, yes, yes, we will. But here's the thing. They had no idea what they were getting into. So that, and we do that sometimes with the Lord. We go, yes, Lord, you know, we go to the altar call, whatever, we commit ourselves. We don't know necessarily everything that we're getting into. But here's the thing, the Lord celebrates and loves the yes in our heart, even when it's done in ignorance. The Lord loves when we say yes to him. And so in the next verse, actually it's in Deuteronomy chapter 5, when we look at the account there, the Lord celebrates. Deuteronomy 5, 28 through 29. He says, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. So they said, yes. The Lord says, they have done well in all that they have spoken. And then he says, oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and they would keep my commandments always that it may be well with them and their sons forever. Like the Lord's like, oh, this is wonderful. They have no idea what they're getting into, but they're saying yes to me. And he goes, I love this. I lo-. The Lord celebrates our yeses even when they're done in ignorance. And he goes, because if they obey me, then they'll be blessed. And I want to see them blessed. So it's a beautiful picture. The Lord now proposes to Israel. They say yes. They're at the foot of the mountain. And now we're getting to the part of the story, which is the actual betrothal or marriage covenant. So amen and amen. We'll jump into that in the next session. Until then, God bless and Maranatha.